DiscerningHearts.com presents Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. I'm your host, Chris McGregor, and I'm delighted to be joined by Anthony Ryan, the Marketing Director for Ignatius Press, to discuss St. Therese of Lisieux, Living on Love, by Father Dutier Marie Gollet. Father Gollet is the chaplain of Lisieux and is a member of the Order of the Discalled Carmelites. Father Gollet is the co-commissioner of the exposition, Therese of Lisieux, Burning with Love, which travels across France and throughout the world. He contributed to the building of St. Therese's Memorial at the Carmel of Lisieux and at the Cloister of Mercy in the Basilica of St. Therese. With Anthony Ryan, we discuss St. Therese of Lisieux, Living on Love, by Father Dutier Marie Gollet, published by Ignatius Press. Tony, thank you so much for joining me. Chris, it's great to be on. Thanks for having me. Maybe I need to say not only thank you for joining me, but thank you, thank you, thank you for this incredible book, St. Therese of Lisieux, Living on Love. What a gorgeous book. What a book worthy of its subject. Thank you so much. Yeah, you know, it really is a, uh, it's an absolute treasure, this book. Uh, You know, at Ignatius Press, we love St. Therese. We've published actually quite a few books on her over the years. And we actually have some films on her as well, movie, documentaries. So we're big devotees of Trez. We felt like, you know, we've done so much on her. What, what more can be done on her? And yet this book came from France and Father Fessy, who reads French, you know, read a lot of it. And, and we looked, just looked at the photos and we just were stunned by it and thought, wow, here is another uh, kind of a new look at St. Trez. And we think it's probably the greatest book we've ever seen on her because uh, it combines, you know, over 150 stunning photos and and artwork, images of art, along with really in-depth text. And, uh, and, you know, you've looked at it. We can talk about that. But it's actually, you wouldn't want to just call this a coffee table book. I mean, you can put it on your coffee table because the photos are amazing. But there's so much great text in here, insights into her life and her spirituality and her family and what was going on in the church and the culture and the world. I mean, this priest, and the reason people are listening to me and not him, is he's in France, Father Didier Marie Gollet, who was a Carmelite, put the book together. He's an expert on Trez. He has a uh, exposition on her, a traveling exposition on her that I think this book actually came from because, you know, he's been doing this for years going around France and Europe with this exposition. And a lot of the images and stuff we see in this book, I think he had in his exposition. So he's a real expert on her and her life. And he's a Carmelite and he's a chaplain right there at Lesseux. So, um, you know, this is really a gift for us to really learn way more than we thought we ever knew about her, her spirituality and her, her whole life. Yeah, that's the first thing that when you see it, you mentioned the term coffee table book, and those in themselves are gorgeous. I mean, you guys produce those as well, and it, there's something about holding that something that's substantial, that has beautiful images. You just take it and you drink it in like a good coffee. But as you said, this book has so much more. It took my breath away because like you, I have a great uh, love for Therese, and I've developed over the years this incredible, wonderful admiration and love for her family. And when I opened this up, I was so filled with joy that the family, not just her mother and father, the great saints, Zelie and Louis, but her sisters and her uncle and her aunt and her cousins and the whole gallery of the Martins and all their interconnections. It's a feast. It's an absolute feast. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, and, you know, the thing we learn is that Trez came out of that. What made her great was the foundation of her life, which was her family. So we learn from this book and her story, what is it like to live in a great Catholic family? And how can we imitate that? What can we learn from that family that we can put into practice in our own families? And we can learn a lot. I mean, this family, uh, it's like Trez, you know, I think often they're misunderstood because we don't really get to know them. They were very much like us. They were very human. And yet they they strove to, um, you know, live this great love that they had to really live it and to share it with others. They, they were not a family that was uh, looking inward. They were a family that took care of lots of people outside of their home. They were always concerned about the poor 
leper and the, and the marginalized and, and uh, always were looking for ways to help other people. So Therese and her sisters grew up with that culture, that, that kind of love in their family. And, you know, that's really what formed her. And uh, even though she herself had personal challenges, as we know, in her own character, her own sensitivity and, and, and things we can talk about that, you know, and she had to work to overcome them like we all do. Uh, she had that basis from her parents and from her siblings of this great pillar of, you know, strength and love. And that's why the subtitle of this book summarizes her whole spirituality, living on love. That was the core of her whole life, her whole spirituality. And really that came from her family. It's just, you say, we learn a lot about in this book. The thing about Therese's family, and people may not realize this, I didn't know until I really got to know the family and read many of Zelie's letters and other things, is that, as you said, Therese, so much of who she was came out of the heart of a family that was formed out of so much richness of the church. The reason I say that is that a lot of times we think of Therese, and of course she was a Carmelite, but her mother, Zelie, they did not really have a, a saturation of Carmelite spirituality until after they moved to Lisieux. Before that, her mother, Zelie, was a third order Franciscan. Her aunt was a visitation sister, steeped, of course, the charism, comes from Francis de Sales' introduction of the devout life. They lived with so many things that are available to us today. It wasn't just the deep contemplative prayer, but prayer was a part of everything they did. And you really see that in this book, don't you? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, the faith, the prayer life uh, was really the core of everything. And of course, again, to, for Trez being the youngest in the family, she learned it early. Uh, and often the youngest in a family benefits so much from having these older siblings that they learn from and they try to hang with and try to imitate. And, and, and there's just, you know, there's certain benefits to being the youngest when you have siblings like she did and parents like she did. And of course, she was, you know, as we read, she was somewhat spoiled because of that. And, uh, you know, she had to overcome that. But as you say, prayer was really kind of the core of this family. Still, you know, they had all the struggles that we all have. They were, you know, they were a family that uh, dealt with lots of challenges. There was a lot of suffering in this family. I mean, people would look at the kind of the, on the surface, the story of this family and think, oh, well, they kind of lived this unusual, lived in some kind of a Catholic bubble and you know, their life was just kind of great for them. Well, no, life was, they had a lot of suffering. She lost four children. She and Louis lost four children that died when they were young. A lot of people don't know that about this family. They had nine children. Four of them died when they were young. And that, you, I can't imagine that sorrow. I can't imagine one child dying, much less four. So, I mean, again, that's just one example, of the kind of suffering that they dealt with. And when Tress is born, she thought, she was very afraid she was going to lose her as well because she had lost so many when they were young. And uh, Trez's health was kind of delicate as well. And so they, they had a lot of suffering in this family, and yet they dealt with it in a way that made them what they were, this great family of saints, really. Yeah, there's so many different aspects to it when you get to know all of the children. And this book does really it reverences the, the other daughters. And we've talked about this in previous conversations that their daughter, Leonie, who has been termed by some as the difficult child, actually probably shows many of the characteristics. Again, I'm not a psychologist, and it hasn't been officially stated as such, but it sure it looks like she has a lot of the characteristics of someone who is in the autism spectrum. And the challenges that came with her health, and for parents who are trying to deal with child who may be exhibiting these kind of special needs. And in their city was at one point an occupied city under oppressors that came in, and they actually had their home at one point occupied by soldiers. These are things that are very interesting that a lot of people who maybe think they're pretty knowledgeable about Trez and her, her life don't know about her life, her family life, which again is the foundation of what made her what she is. She only lived to be 24. Most of her life was with her family. And so, yeah, I mean, her house was actually occupied by uh, soldiers, uh, enemy soldiers. And as you said, Leonie, we have a book on her 
separate book just on her because she was, quote unquote, uh, as you say, looked at as the problem. child. She had a very hard life. She had these uh, these health issues that, uh, as you say, today we would probably say she was somewhere on the autism spectrum. She was a big challenge for Zelly, the mother especially, but the whole family. I mean, she was, uh, she had behavioral issues. Uh, and uh, you think in a family like this, oh no, they were all, you know, like angels or something. No, no, they were human beings. And Zelly, uh, Leonie especially was very human. But the great thing about her, which is really encouraging for us, uh, is that she struggled against this mightily for her life, her whole life. She wanted to become a nun, I think three times, and she persevered and she finally was accepted by the visitation order. After Trez died and the spirituality of the little way became known, Leonie said, I am the first disciple of my sister's little way. I am her first disciple. I am putting that into practice in my own life. And later on, she said, that's really what helped me to conquer my character defects and, you know, to grow in virtue. And she's now, her cause for canonizations has already been open. So she's actually ahead of her other sisters in that whole issue of causes being open for sainthood. So it's just a great story. Yeah. And there are so many of these kind of hidden stories that you find in this book, because and when you talk about a family, it isn't just about the mom and the dad and the sisters, but you have to include the aunt, the uncle, the cousins, Uncle Isidore and Aunt Celine, and how they help support the family. It's the extended family that helped them through their struggles. You see that, and that's what's so hopeful about this, is that it's not something that's done in a vacuum, and were they all perfect people? No, but they were striving for something more. They were striving for holiness. That's like you and me. I mean, we're not perfect. We mess up. We have problems, but we begin again, and we continue to strive for holiness. This is what's so great about the the examples that you find in this book. Yeah, I agree. I mean, again, uh, for those of us who have been kind of devotees of Trez and and feel like we've read a lot on her, uh, or even those who haven't, this opens up new uh, vistas into the life of this, not just trust, but the, the extended family, the fam- immediate family, extended family, as you say. You know, and we all have family and extended family. So what you learn, again, from this family is that everyone contributed. You know, the, the aunts, the uncles, uh, as you say, they were close and they kept in touch. That's the other thing is there's a lot of letter writing back in those days, amazing letter writing. Mizelli was an incredible letter writer. So you learn a lot just from the letters and a lot of them included in this book, excerpts from various letters of Zelly and from Trez. Trez was a, you know, wrote letters and, you know, so you have that whole thing of communication back then. Uh, and, uh, you know, you just learn a lot from that and also kind of reminds us that, you know, we could be better at that ourselves in terms of making the effort to communicate with others by letter writing or today it's more like emails, but however you do it, It shows you the importance of doing that. We'll return to Inside the Pages in just a moment. This is Chris McGregor of Discerning Hearts, a nonprofit Catholic apostolate dedicated to evangelization and spiritual formation through the use of new media. Discerning Hearts creates engaging multimedia specializing in audio and video productions which are faithful to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and its rich, authentic spiritual tradition. Its mission responds to the Church's call to use the media for evangelization, catechesis, and spiritual renewal. We have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truth shared through Discerning Hearts totally free to users throughout the world. Besides our website, DiscerningHearts.com, Discerning Hearts has a newly updated free app where users can find all their favorite Discerning Hearts programming, including Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more. There, too, you'll find numerous beautifully produced devotionals and novenas, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, to help users create a sacred time for prayer wherever they may be. Discerning Hearts programming can be found on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. 
Discerning Hearts also has an ever-growing YouTube channel. Discerning Hearts online spiritual retreats and seminars have helped souls in North and South America, Europe, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, and the Philippines. For many people all around the world, Discerning Hearts is a daily source of inspiration, spiritual nourishment, and encouragement. We can only do this thanks to the generous financial support of our friends and benefactors. Please consider donating to our mission today. The world is looking for answers, for spiritual guidance and authentic discernment, for relationship and community. Your support is very much needed and appreciated. Please keep our mission in your prayers and tell a friend about Discerning Hearts. We now return to Inside the Pages. Again, I don't want to lose the heartbeat of this book. The heartbeat really is Therese's heartbeat. You see it, but you see it, it branches off into the experience of all these others. And the stories that you will find in here, I kind of marveled at it. Because even in this book, like here's an example, Tony, and I'm sure you've seen this too. I've heard it said, but I've never seen it in print before, the Leo Taxel affair. The man, the atheist who set up a trap, essentially, for the folks in Paris who fed a false story about a woman he created called Diana Vaughn. He creates this character, and she is going to reveal herself from this atheist. She was involved with uh, Freemasonry and everything, this faux character. And Therese reaches out to her in a letter uh, to give her courage. And Therese is, of course, in the cloister at this point, and no one knows who this little one is. She sends a letter of encouragement to this sensationalistic figure. There is this moment where Diana Vaughn, quote unquote, is going to make her debut, and actually Leo Taxel is going to use it to kind of make a mockery of the whole thing. And when all the people of Paris come to see her, Instead, he reveals that she's fake, and then he reveals this image of Therese dressed as Joan of Arc, who has sent this to her to be a source of encouragement. Oh, my gosh. And everybody laughs. Everybody thinks it's the greatest humiliation, as it were. Therese, all she is is this little Carmelite. And you rarely see that particular story conveyed. I've heard it before. But the author and the, the Carmelite priest who put this incredible book together, St. Therese of Lisieux, The Living on Love, he knows that story, and he puts it in print. Right. No, I mean, again, that's, that's the beauty of the, one of the beauties of this book is that you see these kinds of extra stories in there. They're, you know, sidebars or they're little inserts into this book. I don't mean physical insert, but there are little things uh, that are just included in there that tie in with the, the larger narrative of the story of Trez, of her family, etc. But things that you would not have known about that are really interesting because they have to do with their lives. You know, I mean, the story you just told, that's kind of an amazing story that she writes this letter to this imaginary person who really didn't exist because everyone thought she existed and Trez wanted to um, console her and to help her. And she did it at the suggestion of, I think, Mother Agnes. And yet, uh, you know, this is a, you know, could have been a great humiliation for her or whatever, but it didn't really matter. She did it and she did it out of love. And that's the kind of stuff you see throughout this story is all these things that she did out of love, living on love, as we say, is the subtitle of this book. And it's just amazing. Uh, So besides the narrative that runs through the book about her and her family and everything, you have all these incredible additions, these stories that you just gave an example of and her, you know, her people that she had connections with or, um, you know, missionaries that she wrote letters to. It's just endlessly fascinating to me, this book. I mean, I, I keep picking it up and reading sections of it every day. And that's the other thing about this book is you can pick up and just read any part of it. You don't have to read the whole narrative. It's not like a kind of a story that you really have to read from the beginning till the end. You can do that if you want. But the beauty of it is there's so many interesting little segments in here and sidebars. And then there's this whole chronology in the back that you can just look at for a long time. It gives you the kind of side, the uh, tells you what's going on in Trez's life, her family life, the life of the church, the life of the culture, the life of the world. It's just, yeah, there's just so much to um, hold your attention 
every time you pick up this book. Yeah, it makes you want to go to the other books, the other resources. It's one of those things that can open it to just about anywhere. And whatever you needed to see or be touched by, there it is. There's that picture, there's that image, and you want to learn more. And just the little prayers and the little glimpses into her poetry and different things like that, it's so well done. It's a perfect gift, really. I mean, this is the type of thing that you would give, not only to celebrate Teresa's feast day, what a great gift to give to somebody on All Saints Day, or as a confirmation gift, or somebody for baptism, or whatever that might be. Someone going through the RCIA, what a wonderful lasting gift it would be, don't you think? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, a gift for anyone that you want to give at, at any time, as you say, it's not really just for Christmas, although it's obviously the Christmas coming, it's perfect. Uh, but if for any time of the year, it's a perfect gift, a birthday or, or anything. Sometimes they, you know, there's the old saying, the uh, cover is worth the price of the book alone on some books. Well, that in some ways could be said about this book because it has this incredibly beautiful I think it's a watercolor painting of Trez, but there's a painting on here by a fellow named Ricardo McCarran, and it is just a glorious, beautiful painting of Trez, and it's just, I've never seen it before. So that's the cover of the book. You open up the book, and right away you see another color, uh, a different artist painting of Trez, and it's, it's, a, it's a whole different kind of painting than the one that's on the cover, and it's more modern, and yet it's very well done. And that's just what this book is like all the way through it. You just keep every page. You come across these striking images, striking photos, striking uh, works of art, uh, you know, all these things, these little segments in there. We talked about stories and sidebars and history. But, yeah, the, the photos are amazing. And as we know, back in her day, the camera was coming into its own and her photography was coming into its own. And, and Celine, her sister was a big photographer. So thanks to Celine's love for photography, we have a lot of these fantastic photos. And then Celine was also an artist. So she did some of the artwork that's in this book as well. It really is a treasure. It's a spiritual treasure. It's a physical treasure. It's an art treasure. It's a, it is an amazing, amazing book. The thing that is the best part, I mean, you can have a beautiful treasure chest, but if it's empty, all it is is a box. It's the same thing, and I, and I say this out of all reverence, you can have a gorgeous tabernacle. It's what is contained in it. And I, I'm not trying to use hyperbole here, but I really truly believe that's the thing about this book is that it's not just a gorgeous book, which it is, but it's the treasure that's inside of it. I mean, I know you. You love Therese. And I do, too. And I have really come to love her even more deeply over the years. Once she becomes your friend, watch out. You end up having a friend for the rest of your life, I think. Well, and it's funny because she actually uses those exact words that are quoted in this book, uh, where she said, quote, I am your sister and your friend. Forever I will watch over you. And that's really kind of the goal of this book is for us to develop a deeper friendship with St. Therese of Lisieux. And I'm always trying to do that because I feel like there's always things I can learn from her, put into practice in my own life. And that's why not only was she canonized and pretty quickly after she died, but she was made a doctor of the church. So that is something, you know, we, we have to think about how is it that, what, why was she made a doctor of the church? This 24 year old, young woman who lived a hidden life. No one really knew her except her own family and those in the monastery. And yet she's a doctor of the church. So that's an important thing for us to think about. And this book brings that out, that she was made a doctor of the church because she has a special charism, a special gift, a special message, a special doctrine for our times. And that's why doctors, uh, certain saints are made doctors of the church. They're get, they have this special uh, you know, doctrine or message for us or charism, and hers is the little way. And yet it's, and it's not, it's, it's little, but it's, it's, it's strong. You know, it's, it's important. It's crucial. And we can imitate it. That's the beauty of it. She saw herself as the little Therese, as she called herself, or the little flower. But I think often uh, people misunderstand her because of that. She was really a steel magnolia is what <laughs> she was. She was, a, she was a woman of strength because she lived this spirituality of love to a heroic degree out of her passion and love for Christ. And this book shows us how we can 
put that into practice in our own life. Yeah, I think, you know, Tony, many of us, I know I have, and I know others who have, and I'm sure you do too, who have pleaded with St. Therese for help. Pray with us, St. Therese, I need help. My family needs help. My children, my mother, my parents, um, we just need help. And I think in some ways, her bringing us her family, and yes, she brings us right to the Lord and, and Christ, but she brings him to us in the heart of our families. And she brings us her mother and her father and her sisters and her cousins and all these other people, because in their stories, they too touch us. They, we can identify with somebody in that family. And we become a part of a family. I know she's a doctor of the church, but the Martins really are the family of the church. If there were ever such a category, besides the Holy Family, of course, the Martins have something for all of us right now because the family is the thing that has always been under attack, but it really is under attack today, isn't it? Yeah, no, that's well said. And, and uh, uh, that's why this book, this saint, this family is uh, very um, timely for us today because, as you say, the family is really under attack today, un- unlike perhaps ever. And uh, as we know, and, and, and the Minister of Our Lady of Fatima and, and Sister Lucy said that. She said mm-hmm. the final will be on the family, on marriage and the family. And that's what's going on today. And so, again, Teresa of Lisieux and her whole family are very uh, timely for us to, to learn from them. And as you say, there's someone in that family each of us can identify with, or maybe more than one. But mm-hmm. you're a parent or you're a, a child. And as I say, Teresa, who is a doctor of the church, that's what made her who she was, this family. She came out of this family. And, uh, you know, there's just so much to, to learn from the family that she came out of. And this book, again, uh, even though it's really about her, it's not just about her. It is about uh, you know, her family and the Carmelites and, you know, everything that influenced her. Gosh, I wish we had more time. I, okay, you and I could talk about St. Therese and the whole Martins for, I think, well, forever. But any final thoughts, Tony? Well, the subtitle of this book, so it's called St. Therese of Lisieux, the subtitle is Living on Love. I, again, that's very important because it's the core of her life, was living on love. And the poem, she wrote a poem called Living on Love. Again, people forget, she was a poet. She wrote some pretty beautiful poetry. And this poem, uh, which they give the whole poem uh, right at the beginning, first few pages of the book, I think it's just a great meditation right there. You start by reading the poem of which this book is based on, the subtitle. And, you know, she evokes the great themes in this poem that fortified her spiritual life, you know, the indwelling of the Holy Trinity and the innermost part of her being, the importance of the, you know, scripture, the word of God, the importance of the sacrament, especially the Eucharist, the mercy of God, charity. I mean, it just, she goes through all these things in this poem. And to me, just that poem alone is just an incredible kind of summary of her own spiritual life. And for us to learn from, and uh, a great meditation, uh, which again kind of summarizes what this book is all about, which is you know the spiritual program of living on love that we can uh, put into practice, and especially if we ask Saint Therese to help us do so. It just begs me to say, I love it. <laughs> I mean, I, I love it. The, everything about it, and uh, I hope, I hope this will get in the hands and more even dive deeply into the hearts of everyone who's listening and for those that they care about. Thank you so much for your time today, Tony. And thank everyone at Ignatius Press for bringing us this gorgeous work. Uh, Well, thank you for um, having me on to talk about the book. Thank you for all the great work that you're doing with Discerning Hearts and with Catholic Radio. We really appreciate it, Chris. With Anthony Ryan, we've gone inside the pages of St. Therese of Lisieux, Living on Love, by Father D.T.A. Marie Goulet. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, visit Ignatius.com, the website for its publisher, Ignatius Press, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit DiscerningHearts.com. Or you can find it within free Discerning Hearts app. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission 
And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerning hearts. And join us next time for Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors.